So what I would like to uh, talk about is um, uh, a recent work with Yves Colin Verdier, but this is just the mathematical part of the work. And actually, this is uh, related to some experiments which are done in uh, the physics lab in, uh, uh, in Lyon, in the NS in Lyon, by Thierry Doxois and uh, all the team uh, uh, around Thierry Doxois. So um, it will be, um, so this uh, strange wave that I will talk about are internal waves. But before I uh, really uh, try to explain how they behave, I would like to recall some very basic things about waves. So I guess that most of you uh, actually uh, uh, know all this because this is uh, uh, very basic, but uh, it, it, it was supposed to be a, a seminar uh, for also for students. So I, I will uh, start with uh, light and sound. Um, so uh, sound, as you know, uh, is, uh, is uh, also called uh, acoustic wave. So this just describe a small departure from equilibrium in a compressible gas, in a compressible fluid. And so what you uh, can see, or not really see, but uh, OK, uh, this is not is that uh, uh, the, the signal in the sound correspond to uh, just some uh, variation of pressure. So uh, at some point, you have that uh, particle will concentrate, and uh, so the pressure will be higher, while at other uh, very close points, you have that the gas expands and the pressure decreases. Okay, And so uh, uh, this, uh, this signal is just uh, the, the value of the pressure. Okay, So it will depend, of course, on, on space. Okay, and it will depend on time. Okay, and there is something which is really important: is that uh, this uh, this uh, sound speed. So we will uh, I, I will define it uh, just in the, the, the next um, uh, picture. But uh, this sound speed uh, is not related to the velocity of particles. The velocity of particles in general is uh, is very uh, uh, small. So you have very small displacement of particles that just oscillate around their. Uh, uh, mean position here, but uh, uh, what can uh, move very fast is the, the signal. Okay, so uh, th these are really uh, two independent things: the, the velocity of the matter and the sound speed. Okay, so this is uh, this is uh, just the uh, say the most basic uh, wave, and with this most basic uh, wave, what I would like to discuss are some uh, very important notions for the propagation of waves. So the first, uh, uh, thing, the first uh, thing that I have to define is the wavelength. So the wavelength is just the uh, typical distance between two crests here. So this is the wavelength. And its inverse is uh, the wave number. And then you can also define the, the, uh, the time in between two crests, which is called the period. And uh, the inverse of the period is just uh, uh, the frequency. OK, and so for this acoustic wave, so for the sound, or for uh, electromagnetic waves, so for the light, uh, what you can uh, uh, prove is that the wavelengths and the period are, are uh, proportional to each other. And uh, their ratio is, uh, is exactly the sound speed. OK, so the sound speed is just uh, the ratio. So here it's denoted by C. And it's the ratio between the frequency here, so the time frequency, and the, and the wave number. OK. Okay, so this is something which is uh, very well known, so I will not uh, spend too much time for, on, on this. Uh, just a couple of uh, remarks about sound. So the pitch of the sound depends on its frequency. Okay. Uh, now the volume depends on the amplitude, on the energy which is uh, contained in the, in the signal. And the tone is related to the profile of the oscillation. So here there are many examples uh, of uh, different instruments and the typical signal which is emitted by this uh, instruments. OK, so this, this is, uh, uh, say, the, the global picture for this sound. And now what I would like to discuss a little bit more about the sound is uh, uh, the reflection on boundary. OK, so the phenomenon of echo. So what you uh, probably know is that uh, if you are in a homogeneous medium, then the sound will propagate in all directions. OK, and the velocity, the sound speed, will be uh, isotropic. So it will be the same in all directions. Okay, and it will be constant if the medium is really uh, homogeneous. Okay, but now if the medium uh, changes, then the sound will uh, will be uh, uh, reflected and refracted. Okay, and here if we consider the very specific case where uh, the this the medium is not really uh, changing, but you have just a boundary, and you have only uh, the the reflection part, and so there are. Uh, 
so the, the easiest case is the case where the sound will uh, just comes orthogonality to, to the boundary. And then uh, what you expect is that uh, it will be just, uh, uh, the signal will be uh, just bounced back up to, of course, a small attenuation. But here, I will uh, completely neg neglect uh, all this uh, attenuation uh, phenomenon. OK. So this is the case of frontal reflection. And now, if uh, you have an oblique reflection, so here, actually, the picture is very bad because it's completely uh, wrong here. You, what you expect is that if uh, the, the, you, you, are, you look at the ray, so the, um, according to which you have the propagation, then you expect this ray to uh, follow the same trajectory as a billiard ball, so uh, just specular reflection. Okay? So this is just uh, uh, you obtain the, the reflection just with um, um, respect to the normal here. Okay, so this is uh, just Descartes' law. So all this is uh, very uh, uh, basic, and I, I guess uh, once again that uh, it's uh, just to recall you the basic properties and to uh, tell you that you, now you will have to forget about everything here because for internal wave everything will be different. Okay, so this this. So I think it's really important because uh, somehow we are really uh, um, used to these kind of waves, and so we have a lot of um, of uh, habits just because we have this in mind. And actually, uh, we will see that uh, internal waves they have uh, really really uh, different behavior. Okay. So um, I will try to list. Of course, this will not be an exhaustive list. Uh, um, some properties which are really different for, for this internal wave, but before uh, doing that, I have to define internal waves. Okay, so internal waves ex essentially they, they, they describe some small departures around equilibrium in a compressible, in incompressible way, uh, fluid, but this incompressible uh, fluid has a density which is not homogeneous. Okay, so it's what is called stratified. Okay, so here I try to explain uh, uh, very roughly what's, what it means to be uh, incompressible to, and to be stratified. Okay, of course it will be shorter to write just the equation divergence of u is equal to zero, but now I will try to explain a little bit uh, uh, the intuition behind this uh, incompressibility constraints. So here I have this representation of the fluid, and uh, what I um, what we will see is that uh, in this incompressible fluid, each fluid element, which is represented here by one cell, has a fixed density. Okay? So the density is not homogeneous. You see that uh, the, the proportion of blue and, uh, and white is different in each cell. But each cell has its own density. Okay? And it will move with its own density. Okay? So uh, the important thing now is that uh, you can, of course, uh, move the different pieces here. And so you can have a different repartition of, of density. But uh, you have a very strong constraint, which is this incompressibility constraint, that uh, essentially you can only slide the pieces. Okay? So you cannot superpose two pieces. And you cannot uh, remove one piece just to, OK? So this is exactly as uh, in this uh, uh, kind of puzzle here. So you have all these, uh, all these pieces with their own density, and you can, of course, slide all this, the pieces, but you have no superposition. Okay? So this is really uh, 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 the, the idea behind incompressibility. And you see that this is a very non-local constraint. Okay? Because, of course, if you decide to move one piece here, uh, it, it has strong implication on all the other pieces. Okay, so this is really important because this will be really uh, uh, the, the main reason why uh, these internal waves are different from, from, for instance, acoustic waves. Okay, so now stratification, what is stratification? It means that at equilibrium, so in the absence of forcing or in, in the absence of uh, initial perturbation, uh, you start with a fluid which has a, a inhomogeneous density, but this density is uh, given by a profile which depends only on, on the, on, on on Z, on the vertical coordinate here. And we will assume that this, uh, this equilibrium is stable, so which means that the light fluid is above uh, the, uh, the heavier fluid. Okay, so this is what is called the uh, um, stable stratification. You have the EV fluid and uh, be below uh, the, the light fluid. Okay? And so this means that if you have, see, the only force at equilibrium is uh, uh, just the gravity and uh, this uh, Archimedes force, and everything is at, at rest. Okay? And now we will be interested in describing uh, the fluctuation 
uh, respect to this equilibrium. Okay. So um, the first thing that we would like to do is to to just derive the uh, dispersion relation as for the sound or as for the light. Okay. And so here we will uh, start from the fluid equations. Okay, so here, these are a kind of a simplified version of the fluid equation because here I have already neglected some terms. So here, the, the, the rho bar is the profile of density at equilibrium. Okay, and eta is just the fluctuation of density around this equilibrium. Okay, so eta, so rho, rho bar plus eta is, uh, rho bar plus eta is the, the, the density. Okay, and u is the velocity. Okay, so now this first equation here is just the, the conservation of mass, okay? Because I have assumed that this uh, u uh, is diversion free because the fluid is incompressible, okay? So if the fluid is incompressible, I know that the divergence of u is equal to zero, and then the conservation of mass up to higher order term, so I will neglect this uh, nonlinear coupling, so the conservation of mass just states dt eta plus so divergence of u times rho bar is equal to zero. Okay, so the term which is neglected here is just the divergence of u times eta, which is smaller if I just look at some very small fluctuation. Okay, and now the second equation here is the um, is just the conservation of momentum. So here this is uh, essentially the acceleration, and so you have that rho bar times dt u. So this is uh, uh, yes. So you expect that this acceleration should be uh, proportional to the sum of the forces, which is just uh, uh, Newton's principle. And so here you have two forces. Uh, one is the uh, gravity here. So this is uh, minus g eta, if I write the, the force, then uh, E3. And another force, which comes just from the effect of the uh, neighbor particles, which is the pressure. Okay. And so you see that here I have neglected uh, uh, at least two terms. So one, which is the convection, okay, because I should have another term, which is uh, u times grad of u, because I have uh, an Eulerian derivative. So this one is smaller if u is very small, okay, because it's quadratic. So this one, I have removed it. I have also uh, neglected all the, so here it should be rho bar plus eta, but once again, this, these are higher order terms, so I have neglected them. And I have also neglected the, the effect of viscosity. And we will see that actually for the experiments that are um, uh, done in, in labs, of course, it's uh, very bad to neglect viscosity because it's not so small. Okay, but okay, say for this uh, first approximation, I just uh, keep these two equations plus the equation on the divergence of u, which is equal to zero. And this is enough. So because here you see that you have eta, which has say one unknown, u uh, is uh, like uh, three unknown plus the divergence of u, and I have only uh, one plus uh, three uh, equation. And so the, here it, the, the, the missing uh, part comes from the divergence of u. And so this, this, this guy here is just a Lagrange multiplier which is associated to this constraint. Okay, so the pressure is completely defined by the fact that the diverge of u has to be equal to zero. For instance, you can just take uh, the, uh, just divide this by rho bar, take the divergence, and then you, you get an equation, an elliptic equation for p. Okay, so these are, so this plus the uh, incompressibility constraint is the fluid system that I will study. Okay, so once again, it's not the complete, uh, a fluid system because I have neglected uh, nonlinear couplings and viscosity. Okay, so now I assume that you are in a, a domain which is just a torus or something like this. So no boundary, no nothing like this, and I can just try uh, try to uh, write this equation using a, a Fourier. Okay, so here there is uh, something which is a little bit strange for mathematicians. I don't know if it's strange for physicists or not, but uh, there is this Boussinesque approximation. Okay, so you say that, uh, so the Boussinesque approximation, as I understand it, so maybe it's not uh, the right way uh, to, to say it, is that uh, you have a function rho bar here, which is constant here, okay, and uh, such that the derivative is constant, and the function is not zero, okay, so, and the derivative is not zero. So actually this, this is just because what you expect is that uh, the, 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 the variation of rho bar, so this, uh, this uh, derivative here, is very, very uh, small compared to the rho bar here. So you have only very small variation. So uh, you will uh, take into account the variation of rho bar just in this term, not in order that you don't have zero. But here, for, in this equation, you can just consider that rho bar is a constant. 
Okay? So this is a very classical approximation in physics, which is called a Boussinesque approximation, or in geophysics. Okay? So now if you uh, do this approximation, now this uh, gradient of rho bar is a constant, and this rho bar is a constant uh, is a, a, so, and g is a constant. And so now you have a system of um, linear uh, partial differential equation with constant coefficients. And so there is a very natural way to, to uh, look uh, for solution to this uh, system, which is to use the Fourier transform. OK, so this, this, the, another way to say that is that you will look at, at the solution as a superposition of plane waves. OK, so this is the same. Uh, mathematicians say Fourier transform and, and physicists plane waves, but this is exactly the same. OK? And so these plane waves, they are of the form exponential of i omega t uh, plus uh, k dot x. OK, so k is the wave number, and omega is the frequency, the time frequency. And so if you do that, and you uh, just uh, plug these and that's in this equation here, you will end up with uh, uh, just uh, a system of, uh, of equation. So, uh, essentially, what you have to do is to diagonalize the matrix, and you obtain that the eigenvalues for this system are plus or minus n. So n is this quantity here that I will discuss a little bit later, times the modulus of kh, so which is the, just the horizontal part of the wave number, divided by the modulus of k. Okay, so this, this is just a very simple computation. And this n, you see, it's uh, what is called the, the Brun-Weissala frequency, and it's related to this uh, uh, gradient of rho, so rho prime, which is here, and the rho naught, which is the average value of rho. Okay, so this this is a this has the d dimension of a, a frequency, and this you see has, has no dimension at all. Okay. Okay, so this this is uh, just. Uh, a very uh, simple competition. And so maybe just a remark at this stage that if you, inst instead of looking at uh, internal waves, so which are these uh, waves coming from uh, stratification, you look at inertial waves, which are uh, waves which come from uh, the rotation effect, you get a, a dispersion relation which is very similar to this one. Actually, you get that omega is equal to a constant times k3, so the other uh, part of the, the k, divided by k. Okay, so we will see that actually you have very similar properties for, for these two kind of waves. And so these properties, uh, so here is the first list of properties which are a little bit strange and different from uh, the case of sound. So the first one is that the group velocity is orthogonal to the uh, uh, k. Okay, of course, if you do exactly the same for, uh, for uh, the sound, this is not the case. They are just uh, in the same direction, but here the group velocity is orthogonal to, to k. Okay, now the, the, the second thing, and this will be uh, really uh, the main point here in this lecture, is that the direction, the direction of propagation, okay, so the, the direction of the group velocity is fixed by the frequency, by omega, by the time frequency. Okay, so this means that once you have fixed the omega, you see that it tells you that uh, the kh divided by k, so this is just like um, a cosine or a sine, depending that if you measure the angle with respect to the vertical or with respect to, to the horizontal. But you see that this omega will fix completely uh, the, um, uh, the direction of k. And so as the group velocity is orthogonal to k, it also fixed uh, the direction of the group velocity. Okay? So this is very different from the sound. For the sound, of course, if, if uh, the, the, the direction of propagation of the sound will not depend on the, on the pitch, okay? It will be just all uh, possible direction. Here it's different. Uh, uh, you see that uh, it will be like uh, I change the pitch and uh, not the same people will, will hear me, okay? That's uh, very different. And now uh, the, the last property that is also different is that the modulus of the group velocity is conversely proportional to k. Okay, so once again, this is uh, very different from from the sound, where sound doesn't depend on anything. OK? OK, so these this are really important things. And, and uh, I think, say, maybe uh, the, the most important thing is this second property here, which tells you that the direction is fixed by the frequency, because this will be really essential to understand this, uh, uh, this property that I would like to discuss in the, in, in the sequel. OK, so now I, I would like to, uh, to present a little bit the, the result, the experimental results, which have been obtained in, uh, by Thierry Doxois and all the, the team in Lyon. 
and also uh, some other people um, <coughs> uh, like Leomas in the Netherlands. Okay, so um, so this experiment is a very uh, apparently very simple experiment. Of course, I, I'm not a I'm not able to do things like this, but uh, okay. So what you have here is a, a, a basin here, and it's filled with uh, a salt wet water. Okay, so uh, below you have very salt water, and here you have a lighter um, water. Okay, so you have this stratification which is stable. Okay, and then uh, you uh, excite a little bit uh, the the fluid just uh, with a, a kind of motor which is here. Okay, so you have a very small excitation of, of the fluid. And what you can see after, um, after a while, of course you will not see the color, the color is just uh, the, the treatment of the data, but what you can see with this uh, particle imaging velocimetry is that all the energy will concentrate on some geometric pattern like this. Okay, so this means uh, that uh, essentially here the, the particles are more or less at rest, okay? Here they move uh, uh, very fast. Of course, they oscillate. They will not really. Uh, this is like for uh, for sound. The particles have very small uh, uh, motion, but still uh, the, the velocity is uh, is uh, very high here, and a little bit less high here. But you see that essentially all the energy will be concentrated on this uh, pattern. Okay, so of course you have different patterns depending on uh, essentially two parameters. So these two parameters are the frequency of the forcing which is fixed by uh, just uh, in the experiment, okay? And uh, depending on the other par parameter, important parameter, is the slope of uh, this uh, sloping boundary, okay? So once again, the, the basin is like this. This is this, trape uh, this trapeze here, okay? And so depending on the slope, which is here, and depending on the forcing, you can have different uh, patterns, so you have this, uh, this kind of uh, trapeze here, but you have more complicated things like this or like this, or sometimes you have also a concentration in some corner. So you have different patterns, but these patterns depend only on the frequency and on the slope, okay? And the last thing that uh, maybe we should remark here is that uh, the, the concentration of energy is not equal on, the, on, on all branches of the pattern, okay? So this, 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 these are the observations, okay? And now the question is, is it possible to find an explanation for this? Okay, so this, this is the question. Okay, so the first uh, answer to this question was uh, given by a physicist, uh, kind of, maybe not a long time ago, but uh, maybe some, something like 10 years or 15 years ago. And so it was given uh, just using, uh, uh, say, what is called um, geometric analysis or uh, ray tracing, I don't know, what is the common thing? So maybe I can already explain this uh, first uh, this first approach. So the idea is uh, is the following. So uh, as you remember, of course, you know that once you have fixed the frequency of the oscillation, you know the direction of propagation. Okay, what you know as essentially is the cosine of uh, of uh, or the sine. So the the angle between say the vertical and and uh, the di direction of propagation. So I've actually, once you have fixed the, the frequency, you have the choice between four possible directions in 2D, okay? You have a, a, like a, a cross like this, okay? All, all possible uh, direction on this. So this means that when, when uh, you have a, a wave which approaches the boundary here, of course at some point it has to be reflected because uh, there is a non-penetration condition on the boundary. And so uh, as the, the frequency is fixed, you have no choice the only direction where it can be uh, reflected is this one, okay? So th there is no choice, but of course you see that, uh, so the inclination with respect to the vertical is not changed, but of course you see, you see that uh, as a corollary, you obtain that the wavelengths will, ver uh, will vary, okay? Just so you can, for instance, just draw this page picture here, and you see that you have a focalization uh, because the distance between the different rays here is not the same as the distance between the different rays here. This is different from specular reflection. Of course, if you have a reflection on a vertical or an horizontal boundary, you see that it will coincide exactly with specular reflection. Okay, but here you see that the vertical is not the normal to the boundary, and so something different will happen. Okay, and so now you can uh, just use this uh, this uh, this elementary uh, reflection and try to see what would be uh, the the rays 
what would be the propagation of uh, of uh, of uh, the rays and so you can just choose a, a numerical computation and try to uh, just iterate this reflection so here as i told you on the vertical and on the your horizontal horizontal boundary you see that you have just a specular reflection and then uh, you have uh, this uh, strange reflection only on this uh, sloping boundary Okay, and so you can uh, draw this picture. So for, for mathematicians, actually, you see that uh, this, this is just like, uh, you can just replace this by, uh, by uh, a reflection like this. So if you just uh, have a, a bigger, uh, okay, it's, it's the same to propagate uh, with, say, just uh, straight like this, and uh, reproducing the, the domain uh, by reflection here or to reflect the wave, okay? And you can do the same here and here. And so the only thing is to take into account this uh, sloping boundary. Okay, and so uh, what you obtain if you do uh, this uh, numerical experiment is that uh, the rays will converge to some sloping trajectory which depends only on the frequency and also on the, on the, on the slope here and which coincides, which seems to can coincide with the pattern which is observed experimentally. Okay, so this means that uh, somehow uh, uh, this uh, rate tracing should give um, a good explanation uh, of the uh, physical uh, physical phenomenon of uh, what is called an attractor. Okay, so here you see that actually uh, there are two points which seem a little bit um, uh, not clear at, at least. So the first thing is that you have the impression that you can start from anywhere in the domain and you will always end up on this attractor here. So this is a little bit strange because you start with uh, dynamics, which is like, uh, so in Hamiltonian dynamics, everything is reversible. And uh, you have the impression that ev uh, every trajectory will concentrate on this attractor. Okay, so this is an apparent paradox and we'll explain that actually it's not but uh, this is the first thing which is uh, a little bit strange and the other thing is that uh, you see that uh, this this uh, say using this uh, geometric uh, ray tracing is an approximation and there is no reason why this approximation should be valid because uh, typically what you uh, f so f to use this uh, kind of the WKB approximation I don't know how, how you call it but uh, the, the, the main assumption is that you have uh, a scale separation between uh, the wavelengths okay and uh, the typical uh, size of the of the domain okay but here this is not the case if you you are looking at the forcing, the typical wavelength is of the same size as the, as the, the size of the domain, okay? And so there is no reason why this geometric approximation should be valid, okay? So th these are really uh, two important problems with this explanation uh, with uh, ray tracing. So the first one is not so, so important, and so I will uh, just uh, explain here. So actually, it is true that you have an Hamiltonian system and that you, so if you are just, uh, here we are just uh, uh, looking at the, 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 the geometric approximation. And so the geometric approximation tells you that, uh, that actually, if you would like to describe the propagation of a wave packet, so the, for the wave packets, what you have is uh, both uh, a position, which is x, and uh, this wave number, which is k, okay? So this is an Hamiltonian, so what you have is an Hamiltonian system with these two uh, variable, two conjugate variable, x and k, okay? And then uh, it's true that uh, the, 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 the rays will give you a, a good, uh, a good uh, idea, a good picture for trajectories, but the thing is that you cannot, if you really uh, would like to keep the reversibility, of course you don't need only the, the x, you need to keep both x and k, okay? And so here you see that actually uh, the, the point is that if you uh, really keep, so you have the impression that uh, there, there is a problem because of this attractor, but actually what you see is that okay, the, the x will somehow converge to this attractor, so if it has kind of finite limits up to the, the cycle. But on the other end, the k will diverge to infinity. 
Okay? So this means that there is no real uh, problem with this. Yeah, there is no real paradox. Because of course you have one quantity which converts to something which is finite, but the other one con converts to something which is infinite. And so there is no uh, paradox with the Liouville theorem or with anything like this. Okay? And so maybe um, I I'm, not, I'm not sure that it will be uh, really uh, uh, helpful, but uh, maybe, maybe uh, if uh, most of you know about the, the Schrodinger equation, and uh, and uh, and so here, what you have to really uh, and so for the Schrodinger equation, if you are, you are looking at the geometric approximation, and what you obtain is just a free transport, okay? And so here you see this is a kind of a reverse situation. So for free transport, what you see in the wool space, what you have is that x will go to infinity, and v is like a constant. Here, this is the opposite. So x is like a constant, so it's not a constant because you have still the, the rotation on the, on the pattern, but say it's like a constant, and this is the k which goes to infinity. So somehow what you have to think, so the way you have to think about this, is that you have to exchange the role, uh, say, between quantum mechanics and this kind of things, what you have to do is to exchange the role of position and momentum. Okay, but apart from this, these are uh, this is actually very similar. Okay, so so this this kind of, of answer to the first question. So there is no paradox to have an attractor, even though uh, you have an Hamiltonian system. And so now, um, what you can uh, prove is that uh, uh, so generically, and I will not discuss this uh, notion of uh, generically. Okay, so essentially you need that you have don't. There should not be too, too many symmetries. If you are in 2D, and if uh, the dispersion relation here is homogeneous of degree zero in K, then the solution of, of the Hamiltonian system, so dx over dt equal dh over dk, and dk over dt equal minus dh over dx, exhibit always this phenomenolo phenomenology with an attractor. Okay? And. Um, and so, so we say that uh, we have a more smell foliation, so this means that you have only a finite number of, um, of trajectories which are uh, finite and, and stable, and all the other trajectories, they converge to one of these uh, attractor uh, in when time goes to plus infinity, and to another, maybe the same, but uh, maybe another attractor when t goes to minus infinity. Okay, so this is the global picture that you have. Uh, for all uh, Hamiltonian of homogeneous of degree zero, is that uh, you will have this uh, this uh, more smell foliation, and so you have this this property of attractor, which is uh, very uh, generic. Okay. So this is really important because you see that, for instance, if you are you are looking at uh, inertial waves, this would be exactly the same for the same reason that uh, the Hamiltonian is homogeneous of degree zero. And also, if you consider some mixed wave with stratification and rotation, it's still of homogeneous of degree zero, so all these properties will be still true. Okay, so this is something which is very robust. Okay, so the next uh, slide is a little bit um, technical, but I will try to explain and then write something different. Okay. So what I say is that uh, uh, this means, more or less, that for any Hamiltonian of homogeneous of degree zero, what I can do okay, is uh, to uh, define a, a good change of variable. And up to this change of variables, the, the Hamiltonian will always have this form here. So psi and eta are the two components of, of k up to the change of variable. And x and y are the two components, uh, the two special components. Okay, and what I say that up to the multiplication of by a, a non-negative function here, the, the Hamiltonian, say around any uh, energy uh, level, would be of this form here, psi divided by eta minus lambda y. So you see that, of course, this is homogeneous of degree zero. But what I say is that this is the very general form, up to change of variable of this Hamiltonian describing uh, all these uh, all, all these uh, waves like uh, internal or inertial waves. Okay, so, and so how you can uh, define this change of variable, essentially you use this uh, more smell property. So you, you know that all the trajectories, they go to one uh, attractor at time minus infinity and to another attractor at time plus infinity, 
Okay, so then you uh, look at close to this uh, attractor, say, and then you uh, define one transverse coordinate here, which will be the y. Okay, and then the x is the coordinate along the trajectory here. Okay, and so essentially, if you use this this uh, this uh, variable here, you get that uh, you can always write the Hamiltonian in this form. Okay, so of course you need a little bit of uh, of uh, technical things uh, to, to obtain this. Uh, this is only local, of course, and then uh, you have to work a little bit. But uh, the important thing, and this is the only thing that you need to remember about this uh, slide here, is that because, because this form here is very generic, what you can prove is that there is a quantity uh, that we will call, call an escape function, which satisfies this. So this is the Hamiltonian here h minus omega naught, so this is the Hamiltonian here. And so there is a function psi such that the Lie bracket between uh, the Hamiltonian and psi has a sign here, and it say uh, it's uh, strictly positive. Okay? So what I say is that, say, generically for any uh, Hamiltonian which is homogeneous of degree zero respect to k, I can find a Lyapunov function Okay, such that so this quantity is positive, and so this means that if you are looking at this quantity, uh, uh, the evolution of this quantity with time, you know that it will uh, go to infinity uh, as time goes to plus infinity. Okay, so you have a, this. This tells you that you have a superlinear growth. Okay, so this is why it's called an escape function. It tells you that as soon as you have this kind of Hamiltonian, then there exists a function which goes to infinity along any solution of the dynamics. Okay, so this is really what you have to re uh, remember from this because this is, this is, this is uh, what will be uh, really important. Now to go from this classical theory, so here I have uh, somehow characterized the Hamiltonian dynamics, so the classical thing, the geometric approximation, but now what I would like to do is to prove something for the, 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 the propagator, so for the, 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 the real wave operator for the fluid equations. Okay. Here, this is just an approximation, but now uh, with this property, uh, we will be able to say something about uh, the spectral theory. Okay. So uh, let me uh, just summarize very briefly where we are. So we have, uh, what we have said is that for this internal wave, or, or more generally for any wave such that the dispersion relation is homogeneous of degree zero respect to k, respect to the uh, wave number, what we can prove, so generically, so except for some very particular geometries, uh, there, there exists so, uh, an escape function, so, so an, a function which will, be, uh, which will uh, go to infinity as time goes to infinity along any uh, solution of the classical dynamics. Okay, so th this is what we have uh, proved so far. So now what I would like to do is to uh, do the connection between this Hamiltonian, so this, uh, this, uh, this dynamics this, uh, uh, that you obtain in general by uh, this, uh, this uh, geometric approximation, and the, the real uh, pseudo-differential operator. So here, once again, this is a little bit uh, more technical, but I, I would like to try to explain, but I, I think that this is not... Uh, so what I uh, need here is uh, the notion of symbol of an operator. So this is probably something that you know, even though you don't know that it's uh, called a symbol. So assume that here you have a, an operator, a differential operator of order m of this form. So this is just the sum of different coefficients which depend on x, so which are function times derivative of order j with respect to x. So this is a very uh, general differential operator. Okay. So now what I will, what is called a symbol. And actually, it's exactly like this that you obtain uh, the, the dispersion relation. You just plug uh, the an ansatz with a very uh, fast oscillating function and look at the, uh, the action of this uh, operator on this uh, fast oscillating function, which is the same as freezing this coefficient here and taking the Fourier transform of this operator here. Okay? So the symbol of, of this guy here is just uh, this function, which now depends on two variables, which, which are x here, because the coefficient depends on x. And now I just do the Fourier transform as this function uh, was not a function depending on x. Okay, so now this is uh, just uh, psi here is just uh, the, the Fourier number associated to, uh, to x. So now what I have is a doubling of variable and I obtain this when I uh, freeze the coefficient and take the Fourier transform. Or 
looking at the action of this on a very uh, fast oscillating function, this is the same. Okay, so this is the, the symbol, and if you think about it, this is exactly how you get the dispersion relation from uh, the wave operator. Okay, so the, the way I have obtained the, 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 the dispersion relation is exactly by doing these kind of things. Okay, except that then I have diagonalized the operator, but it's essentially the same. So now what I would like to do is uh, are two very simple examples. Okay, so the first one is just a multiplication by a function. So here you have no derivative, so it's very simple because you have no, no, um, no dependence with respect to, to p or k. So h is just nu of x. And now if you look at the, the dynamics of this, you see that the Hamiltonian dynamics which is associated to this is just dx over dt equal to uh, uh, the derivative of h with respect to p, which is zero. Okay, so dx over dt is equal to zero, so x is a constant, okay? And now dp over dt is equal to minus uh, uh, new prime of x, and so you see that uh, you have that uh, p will go to infinity, it's dp over dt is a constant, and so when t tends to infinity, you, you, you get that p will go to infinity, okay? So this means that this is exactly the kind of uh, situation where you have this escape function. Here the escape function is very simple, this is just p. Okay, P is, if you are looking at any, uh, any uh, solution of this Hamiltonian system with H, which is this nu of X, you obtain that P is an escape function because it covers to infinity as uh, time tends to infinity. Okay, and this is the same for the Schrodinger equation, except that in, instead of depending only on, on X, it depends only on P, and then uh, the uh, escape function will be X, okay? And you see that, of course, you know a lot of things about the, the, the spectrum of this guy, because this is just a multiplication by a function. And so you, you know, for instance, that the, the spectrum of this uh, operator here, this, this multiplication, is a continuous spectrum, okay? And of course, the, 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 the continuous spectrum and is just a range of this function nu, okay? Now there is another uh, case, which is the, the internal wave that I have already studied, but now I, I assume that I am the torus, Okay, so if I am the torus, I can use this uh, Fourier transform and there is no dependence with respect to x. Okay, so now this h of xp uh, is just n times p1 divided by p and you can look at this and you will see that uh, uh, essentially you have only discrete modes here and you can see that uh, there, there is nothing that will escape to infinity because in the torus you see that you, have, you don't have this uh, kind of uh, uh, reflection on sloping boundary. The, the reflection is only on the vertical or, uh, um, or uh, vertical or horizontal boundary, and so the, the modulus of p is constant. Okay, so the, the modulus of p is constant, and the x, of course, is bounded just because you are in a bounded domain. So everything is bounded. So here you have no escape function in this case in the torus. Nothing will go to infinity as time goes to infinity. Okay, and you see that actually, uh, if you look at this, uh, the spectrum is discrete. Okay, and so actually this is, uh, this is just to tell you that uh, there is a very a strong relation between the existence of an escape function and the, the nature of the spectrum. Okay, so here what you find is that if you have an escape function, so which is written here, then you can find an operator A which uh, satisfies this uh, commutator identity. So if you look at the commutator between the operator H, which was my wave propagator, and this A, which is constructed from this uh, function psi here, I obtain that uh, it's bigger than essentially the alpha times the identity plus the compact operator, okay? And so if I have this, this uh, commutator identity, if I have this computer identity, then there is this theorem by Moore which tells you that, so all, all, all these are kind of, uh, say, uh, complicated uh, technical things, but this tells you that H has at most a finite set of eigenvalues, okay? And that's its resolvent, so it's just uh, H minus one or H, mi H minus lambda minus one, okay, can be uh, uh, defined Okay, so of course, if, if you are in the spectrum, a priori, uh, this, this function, this uh, operator is not defined, okay? But here you can define it. It will just send you, send a function which is very smooth in a space which is kind of bad space of function with negative regularity, okay? So this is exactly the case for, for instance, for the Schrodinger equation, okay? So it's, uh, 
Okay, so what we can do is to define this resolvent. Of course, it will not be a very good, a very nice operator, but still it is defined. Okay, so we know that the, the, the spectrum is continuous, but although the spectrum is continuous, we can define, say, kind of extend this. Of course, as soon as the, the imaginary part here is not uh, zero, this is well defined because H is a, a skew symmetric operator, so the spectrum is in the real line. So as soon as this part here is not zero, this is well defined. But what this theorem tells you is that you can extend a little bit up to the axis, up to the real axis. Okay, so we can define the resolvent as uh, lambda is in the spectrum. Okay. Okay. Um, so maybe I will uh, just uh, 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 skip this part, which is which tells you something about say. So now uh, the, the the global picture that we have is that uh, we have this operator, this wave operator, because we uh, have this property that we have an escape function for the symbol. We know that this operator has a continuous spectrum, and so a uh, continuous spectrum you should think about uh, say the Laplacian on on the wool space. Okay, so this is exactly the same. And now if you, uh, of course, uh, it's, uh, this, the Laplacian on the wood space is a very uh, simple operator and we can say everything. Can, we know the spectral decomposition very well. And so what we know is that essentially you have this uh, continuous Fourier transform. And so uh, you see that what is important here in this continuous Fourier transform is that essentially you will ex express everything in terms of uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, plane wave. Okay, and this plane wave, uh, these are kind of uh, eigenfunction of the Laplacian. Of course, exponential of i x psi is is a, a, a kind of eigenfunction of the Laplacian, except that of course is not of finite energy. Okay, so the, the only problem with the exponential of i x psi, the only reason why it's not an eigenfunction of the Laplacian is that its energy is not finite. Okay, and here it will, it will be exactly the same. So you have a continuous spectrum. So you have a lot of, of eigenfunction in the sense that uh, the h uh, applied to this function is equal to lambda uh, uh, times this function. So there are eigenfunction in this sense, except that they, are, they have not finite energy. Okay, so this is exactly the same picture as for this uh, uh, Schrodinger equation or Laplacian. Okay, so here you have a, a continuous spectrum with a lot of uh, uh, generalized eigenfunction. And the reason why they are not of finite energy is that this eigenfunction, they, have, uh, uh, they are singular close to this uh, geometric pattern that uh, uh, appear in the geometric analysis. Okay, so uh, the idea is really that, uh, uh, say, uh, the basic eigenfunction for this problem here, they, they, are, they are like 1 over y, okay, so... Like, like this, they behave like essentially like 1 over y, where y is the coordinate which measures the distance to the geometric pattern. Okay, so this means that, of course, because 1 over y is not in L2, this function, they are not of finite energy, but still they are, uh, they are um, eigenfunction for the problem. And in particular, this means that you have a spectral decomposition. Exactly as the continuous Fourier transform here, you will have a spectral decomposition. And now this means that you can study the, the evolution problem starting from the spectral decomposition. Okay? So uh, the way it works is like this. So you have a monochromatic forcing. Okay? And we know that the, 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 the response of, of the system to this monochromatic uh, forcing doesn't correspond to the usual picture of uh, a resonant or non-resonant mo non mode. Okay, if you have discrete spectrum, you know that if you have a forcing, then you have two alternatives. Either you have you force on a on, a, uh, on an eigenvalue, and then you will have uh, uh, a resonance, and then you expect that you have a secular growth, okay, of uh, of one mode, which is the resonant mode, or you force say, outside the spectrum, and then essentially nothing uh, happens, okay? So here it's different because you will force on one, on one uh, uh, frequency, but this, this frequency is, not, is neither uh, an eigenvalue, it's not an eigenvalue, but it's in, in the, 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 the continuous spectrum, okay? So you are forcing in the continuous spectrum, 
Okay, and then you can use this uh, spectral representation. So you say that uh, the forcing, um, uh, say, is uh, with a frequency omega naught here, and you can just write the solution to the forced evolution problem, and you see that it's, it will be exponential minus i t omega naught, which is the the, fre the frequency of the forcing, and now you you see that uh, uh, this new here is related to the so f is the forcing, so you have this. Uh, this, this, formula, this formula, which comes from a little bit of, um, of uh, functional analysis, okay, so you can compute, say, the spectral measure of the forcing using this uh, resolvent that I have defined with the Moore theorem. Okay? So this is uh, what is called, I think, Plemelge formula or something like this. And now you, are, you see that if you, uh, now this, this is uh, the usual formula that you have say, when, once you have a forcing, which is uh, completely, uh, um, so once you have uh, decomposed on, 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 on the different uh, eigenvalues, then uh, this is a very simple problem, okay? So this is, this is an exact formula, okay? And now if you, you look at this, uh, of course, this is a singular integral because, because this S uh, can vanish, okay? So, what you are interested in is the limit as t tends to infinity of this guy, okay? And so you see that uh, essentially what you obtain is that the u of t will be up to this uh, rotation here. It will be given by this resolvent applied to the forcing, okay? But now with this resolvent, we know how to define it with more theorem, okay? And so this means that, uh, say, to be uh, to say things uh, very shortly. Uh, the, the, the point is that what, what you see in the basin is just the generalized eigenfunction of the system. Okay, so you can just see uh, this uh, kind of uh, uh, eigenfunction. And so the, the last thing that I would like to do is to conclude with this, um, this I think this, this, this mechanism of quasi-resonance is really important and in my, my impression would be that uh, it's really something which is related, for instance, to wave turbulence and this kind of things. Okay, because here you see that you have a forcing which is given with a, a scale which is of the order of one. Okay, so you force the system. And then you see that the system, even at the linear level, so here there is no nonlinearity, so that's why it's not exactly the same thing as wave turbulence, but you see that you have already this, this uh, kind of transfer of energy. Okay, so how, it's, how it goes, you have, um, so it's, uh, once again, it's really different from the classical resonance pro problem. So you see that uh, you have the forcing, which is at a uh, given frequency, okay, and then at the very beginning, you see that, of course, you cannot excite only this mode, just because it's not, it's, it has a, a, an infinite energy. Of course, what, when you give a little bit of energy to the system, you cannot excite a mode of infinite energy. Okay, so the, the, the way it will uh, go is that you will excite uh, a region around this, this frequency uh, omega naught. Okay, so you have a kind of packet like this. But as, as time uh, um, increases, you will see that essentially uh, the, the, the size of the packet will just shrink like this. Okay, and as time goes to infinity, essentially you will be closer and closer to this, uh, to, to this uh, eigen. Uh, to this uh, generalized eigenfunction. So the generalized eigenfunction has infinite energy, and the, 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 the more energy you have in the system, the more you look like to this eigenfunction, okay? And what is important is that now this eigenfunction, if, if you look at this, so the, the behavior as time goes to infinity, you see that in this uh, eigenfunction, you have all scales. And you know perfectly how these uh, different scales uh, are, uh, are um, distributed in the system. Okay, so you start with a system where, uh, with a forcing where everything is on a given, with a given uh, wave number. Everything is of the order of one, the frequency is of the order of one. And then you see that uh, with, uh, along the evolution, you will create a lot of small scales and smaller and smaller scales. Of course, if you add viscosity, what you expect is that after a while, uh, you, you cannot transfer energy to very, very small scales. So you have kind of uh, saturation of this uh, effect. But really what you have is that you create all these uh, very small scales and then you end up with a distribution of energy in the small scales that you know perfectly and which say looks like a little bit uh, like uh, the spectra that you can observe in uh, wave turbulence. 
So I think that this, this, uh, this idea of uh, continuous spectrum and, and transfer of uh, energy in small scale is something that uh, is really in interesting to explore for this uh, wave turbulence. And I will stop here because I think I'm already um, a little bit late. Thank you very much. So if you bring back the slide where you explain the ray tracing, um, I'm okay. wondering what happens when the angle is such, no, yeah, the ray Which tracing one? slide very early. This one? Yes, no, well, slightly after, yes, this one. What happens when the angle is such that you cannot have a reflection? So this is a very good question, actually. This is uh, something which has been studied by uh, uh, Doug Swan and Jung uh, uh, some years ago, and that we are currently, uh, say, studying from more the mathematical point of view uh, with a, a, a postdoc um, uh, right now. So what? So in the in the case of so for an inviscid uh, uh, fluid, what you expect is that all the energy will concentrate uh, on the point which of course is completely crazy because you don't expect this kind of uh, behavior from the physical point of view. But um, so this means that uh, it's really important to add two things, which are viscosity and nonlinearity. And then uh, what people observe in the experiments is that uh, what you have is that uh, a really important uh, nonlinear effect. And what they see is that uh, you have uh, the generation of uh, second harmonic. So they have the, 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 the wave, which is uh, critical in the sense that uh, it cannot be reflected. And then what, what, say, what is reflected is a second harmonic. So this means that uh, somehow you, so the assumption that nonlinearity is uh, negligible and that the viscosity is negligible is completely wrong. Which So this brings me to a second question about, so viscosity, adding viscosity is still keeping the system linear, right? Yeah. So, and, and can you do this in the? This is something that we try to do, but it's uh, quite difficult actually. So fr from the mathematical point of view, what is uh, very difficult is then that uh, the operator that you have. So here, one important thing is that uh, the, um, the, the propagator is uh, an operator which is uh, so either skew symmetric uh, up to, uh, okay, so, or uh, yeah, say it's a skew symmetric. It's really a propagator, so you really uh, uh, conserve the energy, okay? And so you have, uh, uh, say, you have kind of uh, tools to study this kind of operators. Now, if you add viscosity, you completely break this, uh, this uh, structure because you have one part which, uh, which corresponds to, uh, say, uh, the wave part, okay, which uh, just gives you a, a group. Okay? And, and then you have this part which, uh, which comes from viscosity. And then uh, all these uh, more estimate and so on and so on, uh, they are completely uh, wrong in this. Uh, in this, um, and then you expect a lot of. Um, it's say the the spectral approach is not the, the 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 right one in the case when you have viscosity. Okay, so there are a lot of uh, of papers by uh, physicists and also by astrophysicists, and they try to to study uh, the spectrum of this uh, guy by numer by numerics and this kind of things. But uh, actually, it's uh, it's um, it's very bad because uh, you have a lot of um, uh, of so for instance, uh, this is something which is very well known for quantum physics. That uh, in this case, what you have is that uh, the what you will see, okay, is not the spectrum but uh, the pseudo spectrum. And this is really different. So here, this means that the spec spectral approach is not the, 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 the good one. What you have to do is really to, to look at the semi-group, so at, at the evolution problem directly. And then what we expect, but uh, for the moment, we are not able to prove uh, everything just on some very simple model. We can check that this is, uh, this is true, is that essentially you have the, the same process until time of the order of, uh, so if the, the viscosity is of the order of epsilon, then it will be epsilon to the one third. Okay, so you have a first, first uh, evolution, which is really similar to the uh, inviscid problem, just because uh, this is the, the so the viscosity is negligible in this first regime. 
And then you expect uh, to have something which is different because uh, after a while you, can, you have a, a, a saturation of the singularity. You cannot have a, a function like 1 over y, which, uh, which is not admissible for this Laplacian. And so you will have a kind of a boundary layer close to this, uh, close to this uh, uh, geometric pattern. Okay, so this means that at the very beginning you have this uh, inviscid evolution, and then uh, you have a, a saturation. So this means that you will still inject energy, but now the, the, this energy will be dissipated by by, uh, the, by the viscosity. And then you have a, a something which is a stationary solution, and this stationary solution it it is very um, uh, similar to the uh, generalized eigen function. In um, except that uh, you will uh, truncate the singularity at a, at, at a level which depends on the viscosity. So this is the, the, the picture that we, we expect, and we can prove in some very simple uh, model, but for the moment we are not able to look at this um, in the general setting. I'm not sure if you already answered this question, but with this picture you just described, do you, do you have a, a hint of of where uh, the um, amplitude will be highest, because you showed very inhomogeneous. Uh, the amplitude will be exactly so. Uh, so, of course, uh, the, the the experimental pictures they, are, they they correspond to the case with uh, viscosity because uh, viscosity is not negligible. And so, what you expect is exactly this kind of picture. So, the the, the function will be like one over y close to the uh, close to the uh, geometric pattern like this. And except that uh, it will be 1 over y up, uh, up to uh, y equal to a power of epsilon. And then this is just truncated. So this is really like, uh, this is, and, and this actually, this stationary solution, this is the only point that we are, that we can obtain rigorously for the moment, because this is uh, just like uh, uh, very standard techniques of boundary layer. So you, I'm not sure I understood your answer. So you understand why one branch is uh, dark red and one branch is uh, yellow here? Yes. Uh, on this uh, trajectory here? Why is, why is the color so... I mean, I understand that uh, I, I can see the pattern, this... Uh, yeah, yeah. But I, I'm not sure I understood your explanation why uh, you have light colors in the bottom and, uh, and very, uh, very high amplitudes to the upper right. Why, why isn't it uniform along the, the path? Because, because of this uh, focalization, uh, say, each time you have a reflection, you see that the amplitude more or less is uh, multiplied by a constant which depends on the, on the, on the angle. So, uh, this, so, this, so it doesn't explain why it's, uh, why it's not constant on this branch here, but it explains why it, you have this uh, kind of jump between this branch here and this branch here. Because each time, so here this is really uh, the focalization. Uh, uh, this is this corresponds to this picture here. You see that uh, you have this focalization here. So the amplitude, the amplitude here is not the same as the amplitude here. It's just multiplied by a constant. And then, of course, in order to to understand why uh, you have this, uh, oh, it's not. Oh, oh. Why uh, this is not constant along this branch here? Then you have to understand, uh, of course, much more uh, the the role of viscosity. It's that there, there are other effects coming from the viscosity. So the only effect that we are really able to to exhibit for the moment is the fact that it will truncate the singularity here. But but yeah, we are not able to really because of course you have also boundary layer close to uh, to the boundary here. You have kind of boundary layer here, but you have also boundary layers here, and there are a lot of, okay, of, so this is really a pre preliminary result with the viscosity. For the moment, it's not, um, it's not, okay, it's too early. Um, I was just wondering, uh, what about the Boussinesque approximation? Can you say, do you know what would happen if we go in a non-Boussinesque? A situation and say for for our analysis it's exactly the same because here I, I use this uh, Boussinesque approximation to say that the dispersion relation will be this one okay but now if I don't use this Boussinesque relation you see that uh, uh, I can use the symbol of this operator and for the symbol it's exactly the same 
And then, uh, so it's, it's not completely true because the, this operator for the moment is a, is a matrix operator. So you then have to diagonalize. So there, there is a little bit of uh, technical work, but I don't expect things to be uh, different. So here, it was important to use a Fourier transform that all the coefficients are constant. But you see that now uh, we can, with this uh, theory of a pseudo differential operator, we can use any symbol which depends both on x and p, and this is the same. What is important is really uh, the, the, the fact that it's homogeneous of degree zero and it will be the same. So I, I really, I don't uh, expect uh, uh, the result to be different. Uh, so it's also valid for non Businesk. Yeah, Businesk is not important. Businesk is really important if you would like to use Fourier, but not for this kind of uh, general result. At the beginning, you said there were two uh, paradox. Yeah. One were about the reversibility of time, and the second one about the geometry, the, the scales. <coughs> Can you give us the intuition of how you solve the second paradox with the generalized eigen eigenvector? Ah. Um. Do you solve it or not? Yeah, actually, the point is that, say, with the, this eigenvector, or say, with this focusing mechanism, uh, see, the intuition is the following. Is that, okay, you start from, from scales, which are of the order of one, and then, in this case, uh, this is not uh, reasonable to use the uh, semi-classical approximation. To, okay, semi-classical is, uh, is for the quantum case, but here this would be exactly the same with the, the scale separation. But you say that the system, what, what this, this uh, thing tells you is that actually, um, uh, because you have this, uh, say it's, this is why it's not a, a good explanation, but you see that, Essentially, each time that the wave is, um, is reflected on the boundary, you see that uh, you have the focalization and you have small wave numbers. So even though it's not true that at the very beginning uh, you have this uh, separation of scale, then close to, close to, the, bar, close to the attractor, it's true that you have, the, it's, it's true that you have the, the scale separation. And so then all the semi-classical analysis, and this is exactly how you get uh, this boundary layer and how you get uh, the viscous case, uh, you get uh, the, the profile for the viscous case, say close to the, close to the attractor. And this was uh, also what was written here on this uh, uh, on the slide that I skipped at some point here. So what, what this equation tells you is that say somehow the semi-classical approximation is, is, is correct say, in the stationary regime. So it, it, you cannot really use it because there is kind of gap between uh, the starting point and the point where you can start using this uh, geometric approximation. But it's normal that uh, if after some time you have these small scales, then you can use the, the geometric approximation and it's normal that you, you, you obtain the, 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 the right attractor. Okay, so the, the, the problem is this gap between, uh, between the very beginning and the point where you can use this uh, geometric approximation. In, in the experiment, there is no uh, significant uh, diffusion of salt? Oh, there, uh, so <laughs> this is not really my, uh, <laughs> but what I know is that uh, they can use the same uh, experiments, I think for one week or something like this. And after, after this, uh, then they have to uh, redo everything. So they, yeah, they empty the ba basin and start again with a new. And of course, uh, this is uh, much shorter because now they, they try also to have some uh, results uh, on, in the nonlinear case. So with amplitudes which are a little bit bigger. And of course, if the, the amplitude is really bigger, then uh, everything is uh, completely, completely out of work. Uh, after uh, just one run. So, yeah. The problem with this kind of thing is that, uh, of course, uh, yeah, I think probably uh, for inertial waves, it's a little bit, uh, it's a little bit um, I don't know if it's easier from the experimental point of view, but at least you don't expect uh, the, as the rotation comes, is imposed by something which is completely external, you don't expect, say, uh, the, the nonlinearity or things like this to destroy the, the, the the wave structure. One last question. Uh, so, of two ways which uh, where it could go wrong, inviscid or um, linear. I mean, whichever comes first to to break the the solution. Is it 
in the experiment? Is it the, the fact so that in the experiment? Visit? It's not true at all that it's invisible. Because so, okay. so their, true, their first experiment was la laughed linear. like this, and it was clearly wrong. And now it's like like this; it's okay. still wrong. But uh, but the the, the, the the point is that uh, we expect this internal wave, for instance, to be really important in uh, in astrophysics, mm -hmm. especially in the core of the Earth, or and then viscosity is really really small. And so, in this kind of uh, uh, astrophysics uh, situation, they, they expect the nonlinearity to be okay. uh, to be uh, more important correction than this viscosity. But in these lab experiments, it's not the case. In lab experiments, viscosity is not so small. For me, it's the same. You know, it's there are just <laughs> numbers, <laughs> and they are small. <laughs> okay, other questions. So if there is no further question, I think we can thank again Laura for this. Event.